Well, let's uh, let's slowly start. Uh, good good afternoon or good morning if you're in the United States or Canada. Um, welcome to the uh, next online Hot Politics Lab meeting. Uh, the Hot Politics Lab is a lab where we're interested in uh, psychological processes that underlie both elite and citizens' behavior in the domain of politics. And uh, one of the good things of the crisis has been is that we've moved the lab online, uh, which has allowed us to uh, uh, interact with people that would normally be quite far away from Amsterdam and might occasionally drop by, but now we have more direct access to people across the world for both listening in as well as giving uh, presentations. And so I give the floor to Gijs Schumacher, uh, who will introduce our uh, speaker of today. Thanks, Bert. And I'm really excited to have Gordon Pennycook from the University of Regina here today. He works at the Department of Psychology, and he is the very first Nobel laureate in the hot politics lab. Uh, it was a, the IG Nobel Prize for research on, what was it, pseudo bullshit. Um, of course, uh, 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 a super important uh, aspect of the, the Nobel Prize system. Uh, uh, Gordon has published extensively on uh, fake news, uh, a really important problem in contemporary societies. And uh, he is uh, applying this, uh, this work also currently to uh, the Corona slash COVID-19 uh, crisis, where of course there's the whole new world of fake news out there uh, that we can study. Um, as always, we'll have a 20-minute talk, then a Q&A through the, the Q&A box uh, below in your screen. Uh, feel free to write up questions when you have them. You don't have to wait until the very end. Uh, and um, yeah, without further ado, I want to give the, uh, the virtual space to uh, Gordon. Great, thank you. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, the I'm going to basically talk about two papers that we have put online, uh, preprints, not uh, peer reviewed, um, and they relate to people's kind of misperceptions and false beliefs about COVID-19. Okay, so so there is a lot of kind of discussion about this issue, which is the the infodemic issue uh, about you know fake news, misinformation, falsehoods spreading about COVID-19. I'm not sure that I agree that fake news spreads faster than the virus, but, uh, or that's an, if that's a meaningful claim. Uh, but clearly there's a lot of falsehood out there. Um, and not all the falsehood comes in the form of fake news. When I say fake news, by the way, what I mean is a fabricated headline that's presented as if it's true. So that's one particular form of misinformation, but there's lots of different other forms of misinformation that need to be taken uh, into account. And not, you know, a lot of it actually comes from people who are in positions of authority. So uh, in the States, for example, uh, one of the kind of largest and most significant purveyors of misinformation is actually the president, unfortunately. Um, and what's kind of, I, I want to say interesting, maybe sad about the uh, coronavirus situation uh, is that um, there are kind of different waves of different forms of misinformation. So what we're trying to do basically with these two um, papers is come at the same problem in two different sorts of ways. So the first thing I'm going to talk about pertains to people's kind of beliefs and attitudes about COVID-19, whether they actually believe falsehoods about COVID-19. And the second one pertains to the kind of sharing uh, of false information on social media. So I'm just going to focus on the first one first, obviously, and then I'll, I'll move on from there. So what's uh, I'm curious about the, um, the COVID-19 situation in the States is that it's become apparently at least highly politicized. Uh, and an interesting kind of aspect of this is that it's kind of a natural experiment, right? In the sense that you don't see the same sort of politicization in the UK, for example, right? Even though, you know, the, the countries are fairly kind of similar in terms of like uh, culturally at least, um, the issue itself is identical, like the facts about the pandemic are the same in the two countries, you see different levels of politicization. And so what we can see is like whether these, the kind of high level like Fox News, Donald Trump sort of politicization is carrying over to the population, whether there's stronger ideological differences in the States than the UK. Uh, another thing that I'm interested in is Canada. Um, again, since I'm from Canada, uh, our biggest controversy was when uh, our prime minister said moistly on, <laughs> on national television 
Um, but we also do tend to kind of carry over a lot of our kind of cultural influence from the states. Um, and so what we did as a, as a study is we gave the exact uh, materials, uh, exact same materials to all three countries, people from all three countries at the same time, okay? Uh, and the kind of key aspect of this uh, that we tried to do is we, we created this list, uh, which was at the time we ran it, it was March 24th, so about a month ago, or two months ago now. Um, this was our attempt to create as, as systematic uh, a list of falsehoods as we can get. Um, as you'll see here, I mean, a lot of these things aren't believed by that many people. You know, like basically nobody believes that eating garlic cures the coronavirus, fortunately. But, you know, there is still a sizable proportion of people, particularly in the States, that think that the flu is just as dangerous as the coronavirus. This being something that Trump had basically said himself. Uh, and then, you know, some proportion of people think that it was created in the lab. Uh, and but a small proportion thinks it's a hoax. So so you can see that there's some differences um, uh, between the countries here. But what's interesting is the role of ideology and how it differs across the countries, at least from my perspective. By the way, the way that we ran this was on prolific. So in the UK and the USA, these are um, quota matched to be representative. So they're not actually nationally representative, but there there's some attempts to for them to be more than just convenience samples. In Canada, it's just a pure convenience sample, it's just the people that uh, that um, did the did the study, that sign up for studies on Berlin. So, what you see here is the um, the overall level of falsehood broken down by ideology. Okay. So in uh, Canada, you see there's a kind of small correlation here, not particularly strong, but there's a significant correlation there with ideology. In the USA, you see a stronger correlation, but still, you know, people, as I showed before, misperceptions are fairly low, but still they've been higher for conservatives than they are for liberals in the US. There's no correlation at all in the United Kingdom. In fact, there's actually an interaction here where this uh, correlation with ideology is stronger in the US than it is in the UK, uh, but not Canada and the US are about the same. Um, so, or at least nominally the same. Um, so, there you see, I mean, that's, the, that's one piece of evidence, basically. There's more of an ideological split in terms of misperceptions in the states than in the UK uh, and Canada and the states look kind of similar. But these differences aren't particularly large. Uh, what differences are large are these ones. So what we ask people is, how much do they think that their leaders are doing a good job? And specifically in the US, Trump, in the UK, Johnson, Canada, Trudeau. And so here you see, so Trudeau was liberal and uh, Johnson's conservative, and you can see that we have a kind of parallel findings in Canada, UK, where people generally think that they're doing at least a mediocre job if they're uh, ideological, uh, ideologically misaligned, or an okay job if they aren't, uh, but the gap isn't particularly large. Uh, but in the States, it's just a completely different story, right? Like liberals, and which overlaps obviously with Democrats, um, just really, really think that Trump is doing a terrible job. Uh, conservatives, as you can see, are like quite spread out. You know, I mean, some, some think he's doing great, some think he's doing terrible, um, and moderates are also spread out. So <clears throat> the situation, the politicization of the states around leadership is just way stronger than everything else. And it's a, it's a huge difference uh, uh, compared to the other countries. Now, if you're just curious, there's a few other things that we looked at. We looked at people's risk perceptions. That is how much of a problem they think it is. Remember, this is March 24th. So this was around the time that the lockdown started to happen. Um, conservatives in the states are the, are the least likely to think that it's a problem, uh, which is fairly obvious given the kind of uh, politicization that's occurred. Um, you do see a correlation with ideology in Canada, but again, not at all in the United Kingdom. And then this is actually a, a statistically significant difference. Um, finally, the last thing that's important to point out is that Again, this was at March 24th, so we asked about behavior change intentions. We wanted to know, are you going to wash your hands more frequently? Are you going to stop going to, uh, to restaurants, all that kind of stuff? Um, and basically everybody, a lot of people, most people agree that they're going to, you know, act appropriately, basically. There, you see some people that aren't agreeing, but there's not a pretty small number. Um, and the correlation with ideology, which is significant in Canada and the U.S., is pretty small. So even though... You know, conservatives are more likely to have misperceptions and less likely to think that it's uh, a problem. They, they're still 
more or less kind of agreeing at least at least at this point in time at the end of March with the uh, uh, with changing their behaviors. Of course, you know if we ran the study now, we might find something different. So that's important to keep in mind. Final thing I'll note on this aspect is that we also ask people about how much they trust conservative news outlets and also like uh, liberal, I guess, liberal leaning news outlets or uh, neutral at least you might think. Um, and what you see here is that people who trust Fox News and Breitbart are, uh, it's a pretty strong correlation between trust in those news sources and having misperceptions about COVID-19. Uh, very strong correlations with how well they think Trump is doing, um, which probably, I mean, it's not perfectly surprising. Uh, it turns out that trust in conservative news outlets and ideology are both kind of independent predictors of these things. So there's kind of two different uh, lines, uh, avenues by, by which people are influenced there. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of why people believe what they believe, but it doesn't explain a whole lot. You know, ideology seems to be playing a role, but it, there's a lot of different aspects that are going into why people believe falsehoods about COVID-19, apart from ideology, of course. And one of the things that's important to note about COVID-19 is that it's just kind of like also related to other scientific issues. You know, it's a lot of these things are um, falsehoods or conspiracies or magical thinking that you might see in other domains as well. And we have lots of other research that focuses on these aspects, like in non-pandemic uh, circumstances. And what you see from that research is that an important aspect to, to understand is what I'm going to refer to as cognitive sophistication. So what we did in the study is we kind of put together measures of the kind of toolbox that is useful to discern between what's true and false in the world, okay? And so uh, there's four different elements to this uh, sophistication measure. One is cognitive reflection. So there's one of the example problems of the cognitive reflection test uh, on the left there. Um, people want to say 20 days, but the correct answer is 39 days, obviously. Uh, what the, the key to the kind of task is that there's some intuitive response that comes to mind and you have to kind of stop and reflect about it. You have to kind of override that intuitive answer, um, which is the sort of thing that, you know, you could imagine being important in the context of science because you have kind of simple answers that are intuitive but then more complicated things that you have to reflect on. Uh, we also have a measure of numeracy. And so basically just about, do people understand how probability works? Um, which I think has pretty obvious relevance uh, in the COVID context, uh, given that a lot of what people are being communicated pertains to probabilities or odds uh, or percentages and so on. Uh, we also measured basic scientific knowledge. So these are kind of true false, they're all true false questions. Um, and they they aren't specifically knowledge about COVID-19, but just how much do you know about science in general? And so it's kind of a measure of both um, knowledge itself and also kind of interest in science and how much you engage with it. Um, and also an important element given that COVID-19 is a scientific issue. And finally, uh, relating to the Ig Nobel thing that was discussed, uh, that was mentioned at the start, um, we, we gave this measure of what we referred to as bullshit receptivity. And so for this, what we do is we have this, these generators that take uh, buzzwords like quantum uh, and interconnectedness and uh, high frequency and so on and it takes these words and it puts them together randomly into a sentence okay and so this is this is a random sentence it was constructed without any regard for the truth and therefore uh, is what you can refer to as uh, bullshit uh, in our in our view uh, and what we do is we just ask people if they think it's profound and the idea that we kind of validated in our study back in 2015 is that people who rate these sentences as more profound are more receptive to bullshit basically and so this is another element of climate sophistication. The, the measure I'm going to discuss is just the combination of all these things. Uh, obviously, we reverse scored bullshit receptivity, so they're all in the same uh, direction. Um, each, all of them actually predict misperceptions uh, separately, but together we're just going to create one strong composite measure. Think about it as a kind of toolbox of good thinking. Um, and what you can see is that in all three countries, uh, Cognitification is a pretty strong predict predictor of misperceptions. In fact, in the UK and the US, it's a much stronger predictor than ideology. There's actually a significant difference there. It's only marginal in Canada, but you can see the, the trend is basically there. In fact, there's no interaction between uh, misperceptions, uh, or sorry, between uh, ideology and cognitive sophistication. That is, not only does uh, sophistication predict, that is, the higher sophistication, the lower misperceptions, it predicts across countries. It also predicts across ideological lines 
within countries. And so this, uh, this correlation is essentially equivalent for Republicans, Democrats, conservative liberals uh, in uh, US and conservative liberals in, in Canada and US, or Canada and UK as well. So, so it's, you know, even though ideology plays a, uh, seems to be playing a different, uh, important role, but a differential role in different countries, misperception or codification is a, is a pretty consistent predictor of misperceptions. As you can see, it doesn't, however, predict anything related to, or at least strongly or consistently related to risk perceptions or people's intention to change. It's just related mostly to people's misperceptions, okay? So, so that's, the, that's the first bit, okay? Ideology is playing a stronger role in the US than in the UK. Canada and US look more similar, but overall, codification is a pretty strong predictor. That is, the quality of one's thinking uh, tells us something about whether they're going to believe falsehoods about COVID-19. Now, relating to this, to this idea that it's important to kind of stop and think about um, information that we see related to this, the pandemic, uh, next thing we're going to talk about is this, this research on, on fake news. And so it's a, it's a big issue, something that like I, I opened up with this, this problem that uh, misinformation is spreading. Obviously, the spread of misinformation is a major source of people's misperceptions, a, a proximal source of people's misperceptions. Um, and so what we do in these studies is we give people actual like headlines. Uh, I think it's fairly obvious which ones of these are fake. Uh, the two top ones are fake. Some are more plausibly fake, uh, uh, that is plausibly true fake headlines than others. This, this one being more plausible than the one with the weird eye and the, the 666 on the neck. Um, but the, the point of studies is we give people posts that they, in the way that they look basically on Facebook. So these are actually like literal screenshots of what the, these news stories would look like if they were shared on Facebook. Um, and what we do is two things, okay? We have two different conditions uh, in, this, in this study, in the first study of this paper. Um, in the accuracy condition, what we do is we give people these headlines and we ask them, do you think these are basically true or false? Do you think that they are, do, do you believe the headlines essentially? Okay, and so they say yes or no in terms of whether they believe that they're accurate. Okay, and so what you see is that the, the true headlines uh, are believed like, you know, 65-ish percent of the time, which isn't great, you know, they're, they're all true, so they should be believed 100% of the time, but they're, you know, people at least are above chance, so they're not, they're not guessing. Um, and then the false headlines are believed like 25% of the time, which, is, which also isn't that great. You know, one in four of these kind of ludicrous and uh, like uh, egregiously false headlines are basically being believed, but there's still, a, a very large gap between these two, uh, between the true and false headlines. So what we do then, that is, for a different condition, a different set of participants, is we ask instead, would you share this on social media? And so the, the key question here is, do people consider accuracy when sharing headlines, right? If it's the case that accuracy is a key component of sharing, then we're going to see a kind of similar uh, distinction here, maybe the, the you know, the proportions will go down, but the, the gap between true and false, true and false should be fairly similar. Uh, but we don't see that at all. Uh, in fact, the gap is, is, is pretty small. I mean, there is, people do share somewhat more of the true headlines than false headlines. But what's really important to note here is that the sharing of false headlines is actually greater than the belief in those false headlines. That is for different participants. But what this presumes is that people are sharing headlines that they could have identified as being false, uh, just based on their kind of like assessment. I mean, in every in any case, most people probably could if they were asked, fact check the headlines and discover that they are false. But in this case, this is just they don't even they didn't even bother thinking about whether they were true or false. It seems uh, when making these judgments about what what to share on social media, and so it seems a key aspect that's kind of driving the spread of false information about COVID nineteen is that people kind of remarkably, in my view just aren't stopping to think about whether things are true or false. Uh, and so what we did in our next experiment was to try to manipulate this. We, what we did instead is before they did their, uh, the task about, you know, where we asked them about whether, whether they would share that set of headlines, we gave them a single non-COVID related headline at the start and just asked them to, to rate whether it's accurate. And so the idea here is to just prompt them, get them in the mindset where they're thinking about accuracy and then see if that improves the extent to which they can discern between true and false content uh, when it comes to sharing decisions, okay? And so here, the control is just the same as I showed you before, where people are just given some headlines and asked whether they would share them, and you can see people don't really distinguish between true and false, as I showed before. 
Um, and what we do in the, in the treatment, as I said, is we just prompt them to think about accuracy. And so what you see there is basically an increase in people's discernment. That is, the extent to which they discern between true and false content when making judgments about sharing basically doubles uh, when you just remind them about accuracy at the start of the study. Okay, and so that's a, a pretty small, uh, simple kind of manipulation, but one that has at least a demonstrable kind of uh, impact here. This, this research, by the way, this was, these were all run on, on Lucid, so they aren't, uh, again, this, these are not actually technically nationally representative, they're just uh, quota matched to be uh, somewhat nationally representative. And so we, we've done this experiment in other contexts as well, so not related to COVID, we have another paper where we do it uh, on like political headlines, and we've done, uh, we found consistently basically that this, this, impact, this impacts uh, people's discernment. And so uh, the figure's a bit different here, but if you, most of the time what you see is that people end up sharing less false content if prompted to think about accuracy. And so just comparing the, the red and blue bars, you can see that in every case you find a decrease for, for false. In some cases you see kind of slight increase for true. That's what we saw in the COVID case, but that seems to depend on what headlines you use. But with every time we, uh, whenever we've run the study, we find that basically if you prompt people to think about accuracy, it improves people's discernment. Um, I'll just mention briefly one last thing that we did uh, for the political headlines. Um, we also ran an experiment on Twitter where we uh, created a bunch of different bots. It was a big process. We, um, you have to create bots that follow people that shared kind of low quality con content uh, from Breitbart in particular. Uh, and then when they some people follow us back, follow the bots, the bots back, and then we sent them direct messages. Uh, and the direct message sent, had a message about accuracy, uh, a way to prompt them to think about accuracy. And what we found was sending people a DM on Twitter uh, about accuracy improved the extent to which they shared high quality uh, information from high quality sources like New York Times and decreased the extent to which they shared content from low quality content like Breitbart or Daily Caller overall, okay? Um, so there's uh, a lot that goes into this experiment, but overall we found that even a simple kind of reminder via DM is kind of sufficient to get people to, to, to improve the extent of the, the kind of information they're sharing on social media. Um, all right, so I'll offer some conclusions that relate to COVID-19. Uh, first, we find stronger politicization in the US uh, and Canada than, than the UK. Uh, uh, and particularly this relates to not only just political conservatism, but trust in conservative news outlets. Um, but generally speaking, kind of sophistication, like elements of good thinking, being a reflective thinker, having high numeracy, um, having basic scientific knowledge, and not being receptive to bullshit, helps guard against misperceptions. And this is consistently across countries and across political lines within countries. Uh, and finally, one of the kind of elements that relates to this kind of sophistication is this idea of lazy thinking that people on social media just aren't thinking that much about accuracy or enough about accuracy. Um, and that's what's kind of leading to a lot of the spread of, uh, or at least some proportion of the spread of false information on social media, which of course is leading to people's uh, false beliefs about, uh, about uh, COVID-19 uh, downstream. Um, all right, and so that's, that's the talk. Uh, here are the various collaborators, many of which are, so Dave Rand is, the, is my primary uh, collaborator in this work. Uh, and most of these people are uh, in his lab at MIT. John McKinnon Petras is my postdoc and Ben Sizzle kind of joint, joint postdoc between me and Dave. Uh, and they're the funders, and uh, thanks for listening. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gordon. This is uh, uh, a spectacular talk with, uh, I, I think, the, the, the last screen also shows uh, you, you have a lot of collaborators. It's a lot of studies we've seen, uh, and also already uh, quite some questions. Um, so what we'll do is I'll read them um, uh, one by one, and you can just answer them one at a time. Uh, okay. So the first question is from uh, uh, Simon uh, Simon Heidlinger. Um, uh, he says, hello, thank you for your work. This is an interesting field. Right in the beginning, you mentioned that you make the surveys in different countries uh, to, to the exact the same time. Can you yeah. exclude the bias in the time frame, uh, e.g. that the opinion is influenced on time of the lockdown, case numbers, etc.? And how can you exclude this in terms of influence between the countries? Right, yeah, like the, yeah, the countries were at different points in terms of the, uh, the problem, for sure. Um, yeah, I can't exclude that, for sure. Uh, we, I mean, I, what we are going to do is basically run the study multiple times, 
Uh, and so we'll, we're planning on doing it again this month, which will be two months out, and then do it again, and then just see how, how consistent the results are. And so basically, like, as with all these uh, COVID studies, they're kind of just like a snapshot in time. Um, and so, yeah, that's, yeah, basically there's no, nothing I can do to, to deal with that. It's just a snapshot in time, basically. Yeah. Do, you, do you control for for like severity of cases or something like that or or no i mean what we could do i guess is look at we don't have we don't have good location data if we had location data within countries we could do a much better control for that but like the, you know given there's only three countries there's not much control in right okay uh the next question is from somebody with the uh, name political behavior. Uh, you argue that uh, misinformation is an important source that is driving misperceptions. However, you show that misperceptions are highly correlated with partisan news, Breitbart, Breitbart Fox News. Don't mm -hmm. you think that it's uh, strong partisan news that is driving misperceptions rather than misinformation or even fake news sites itself? Uh, I think it depends on what kind of misperceptions you're talking about. Like. Um, the proportion of people that look at here, I'll just go back to the uh, slides here real quick. Um, so if you look at the the various types of misperceptions that we we have here, you know, some of these things like the seasonal flu being just dangerous the coronavirus, that for sure is being driven uh, more by partisan media than by fake news, but you know, thinking that garlic cures coronavirus, which is obviously not believed as much, is also is more being driven by fake news. And so the question is kind of like, what sort of misperceptions uh, and, and 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 when? So I mean, I I mean, I should I should step back though briefly and say that like, to me, quantifying um, how much uh, falsehood is um, being you know is is because of one source versus the other is kind of difficult and probably just like. It's never going to be the same over time anyways. Uh, what's important is that some portion of falsehood is coming from like uh, fake news and misinformation on social media, and some portion is coming from conservative media, media outlets in the States. Uh, the extent to which, you know, one's the other, it, you know, it's kind of an academic issue, it's interesting, but um, they're both important sources for sure. All right. Um... Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Josh Robinson, who is from Leiden University. Uh, you know that cognitive sophistication is negatively related with misperceptions for liberal conservatives. Have you looked at news exposure as well? In other words, is cognitive sophistication also negatively related for those who watch a lot of Fox News, Fox News read a lot of Breitbart? Also, mm -hmm. what's the distribution of cognitive sophistication? Lots of people on the low end or pretty dispersed? Uh, so the first question I'll answer is that it's, it's dispersed. It's pretty normal distribution. Like we, um, yeah, you know, most people are about 50%. Um, I have not looked at the interaction with uh, partisan news. I will, I will do that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. What would you expect? I think it'd be about the same. I mean, th there, there's, there's a literally a zero interaction with ideology. Uh, and so, yeah, so it's just like it's there's not it's not trending or anything. It's just it's just basically zero. Um, <laughs> and so that I mean I would presume therefore that probably it'll be given that ideology and trust in uh, Breitbart and Fox News is pretty highly correlated. Probably wouldn't be interactive. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's another question from political behavior. Um, so the question is: um, Is this uh, You've talked primarily about sharing misinformation, uh, yet uh, this, uh, this, this listener points out that, um, uh, that the work by uh, Guess has showed that uh, only a few people consume fake news and, uh, and share fake news. So um, how important is it then to look at sharing uh, misinformation? Right. Well, I mean, um, so when Guess's analysis on fake news is looking at, you know, whether people click on fake news sites. Um, and, and, some, and then I think they had the one Twitter analysis as well. Um, so that's that's a very constrained version of misinformation. Like that's one specific form, which is the headlines that people see that are constructed, but presented as their like legitimate headlines. But misinformation is is much more broad than that, right? Like there's, there's a lot more co uh, categories, uh, false memes, uh, or just like um, sharing like people's like posts 
with opinions about coronavirus or just like posting your own opinions about coronavirus or whatever. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, that the estimates they got from the 2016 election on fake news is kind of a lower limit. I don't think that that means that there's a low, a, a small number, a small amount of misinformation online. There were some analyses, I think it was Reuters that had, like they said, like, I don't know if it was 600% or 900% increase in fact checks uh, related to COVID-19, um, like that is prior to before. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, there's some evidence that take the fake news problem isn't as big as people thought it was, but I don't think that uh, we're ready to say that misinformation isn't the problem yet. So. Yeah, thanks. Uh, next question is from Isabella Ribasso, who's a PhD student in our lab. Um, she writes, thanks a lot for this talk and sharing your uh, very interesting findings. I'm wondering about the practical implications of these findings. Facebook introduced labels to flag potential misinformation. And these labels were criticized for not being effective enough in spreading this, uh, in stopping the spread of misinformation. Based on your findings, however, we might expect that those uh, to actually be effective, as they prompt users to think about accuracy. Is this too optimistic, or do you share this view? Uh, it's possible. I mean, we, yeah, that's it. It's possible that uh, they would work that way. I mean, it's it. Uh, I, I, uh, we should do. We should probably do an experiment that looks to see if the prompts work that sort of way. Um, it it might not be. It would be that would be awesome if it did. I'm not sure that it, it does work that way. The problem with, of course, with the um, the way that the social media companies are dealing with this sort of thing is that they just don't analyze things in that sort of way, or at least they don't release the analyses, so we don't know one way or the other. Um, I, I do think that they, Facebook certainly and social media companies certainly could implement something that relates more closely to what we're doing quite easily. You know, just like prompt people every once in a while to answer a question as a sort of kind of um, customer, like that is to, to gather information from customers, uh, but ask them about like whether they think something's accurate or whatever. Um, there's lots of different ways that you could implement getting people to think about accuracy in easy sorts of ways. Whether the, what they're doing right now works for that is an empirical question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Matthijs Roda. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. To what extent do you think voting behavior partnerships plays a role? Uh, I would expect that those who support a party or politician who shares fake news or flirts with it are more likely to believe it. In other words, to what extent could this be about party cues as well? Yeah, it's hard. We, we don't really, um, we, don't, we weren't, weren't able to kind of really assess that uh, very much in these because a lot of our headlines that we used they weren't particularly partisan. There were things like vitamin C, but I mean, I gave you a couple examples that were partisan, but not enough to. With kind of sophistication, that is, if you're if you're better at reasoning, you're less likely to fall for fake news regardless of whether it's consistent or inconsistent with their ideology. In fact, those, they're actually equivalent. Um, in many cases, actually, people are, who are smarter are better able to. If, so, and actually what we find sometimes is that people are often better able to discern between true and false content if it's consistent with their ideology because they have more kind of knowledge of what's going on in that world or whatever. Um, and so, the, so like the, the extent to which people have biases that are consistent with their ideology, there is certainly something there because, you know, the way we interpret things that we see is based on what we presently believe. That's how we have to kind of operate. Um, uh, but it's not, a, in my view, a kind of motivated thing. Like it's not that people are hopelessly partisan. They're just kind of, um, they're letting their kind of lazy partisan biases kind of drive some of their behavior. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next question is from Diamantis Petropoulos from the FU University. Hi Gordon, many thanks for uh, uh, your uh, sharing your ideas and results. Uh, one remark, you showed the red arrow pointing at a double, double difference between sharing and accuracy, interpreted as people are uh, willing to share more, even if they believe it's not accurate. People could also be willing to share as a result of wondering if that's true. So it's not safe to assume that they share because they trust it, was there, is there any way to control for that? Uh, so we did another experiment where we, um, where we asked people 
to first, for every single headline that we gave them, we, we asked them, do you think it's accurate? And then after, for that headline, ask them if they would share it, okay? And so what you find is, is three things. So we have that compared to a different uh, uh, condition where they're not asked about accuracy at all. And basically when you ask for every single headline, people share 50% less of the headlines. Uh, and then some proportion, 16%, share uh, the 60% of the headlines that are shared, people believe to be false, but they share them anyways. Um, and so that might be sort of that category that is uh, that was being asked about. And then the other the other 34% uh, just don't, they think that they're, they, that, that is, they think the headlines are true when they're false and they share them uh, anyways. And so that those are basically the three kind of uh, bins, but the, the largest bin is the one where people are sharing things without ever without apparently realizing that they're inaccurate. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, next question from Nikolai Berg from the uh, as a, a research master student at our lab. Uh, thank you for the fascinating presentation. I think it's particularly interesting that people seem to share headlines. They would also see as inaccurate when asked. You presented evidence that this is partly driven by being primed into thinking about accuracy. Do you think there should, could be a second mechanism that works through motivate reasoning? Uh, in other words, people sharing despite being able, uh, of, despite being aware of it being fake, because it corresponds with their political worldview. In other uh, words, yeah. yeah. So that, that's basically yeah, like what I said before. Yeah, like there was about sixteen percent that were doing that, and so that you would expect that most of that sixteen percent were doing it for that reason. I would say, yeah. Uh, I mean, and I wouldn't take that, that number itself is probably a little bit arbitrary, like. It depends on which headlines you have and all that, um, but you know it's a it's a small proportion relative to the people that are sharing without realizing that they're false. So, but an important one like that, I like uh, Michael Bain Peterson has that work on need for chaos, and so there there are definitely some people out there that are sharing things that they know is false. Uh, hmm. Whether that characterizes the typical way that people share false information, which is what we're trying to uh, ascertain here, you know, probably it doesn't. But you know the fact that some people. There are trolls. There are there are definitely trolls on the internet. <laughs> no question about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Occasionally they drop in on a Zoom meeting as well. Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, the, the next question is from uh, Michael Holman, who's also a PhD student in uh, in our lab. Uh, she thanks you for your talk. I was wondering about the role of anxiety in believing in fake news. Do people? So she wonders if people with high levels of anxiety uh, also have more misperceptions uh, that's a good question we have we don't we haven't looked at anxiety we have this, a paper on emotionality uh, people that are um, like the positive and negative uh, affective schedule the PNAS uh, not to be just uh, confused with PNAS uh, um, people who are higher on that tend to be more likely to believe and share uh, fake news in our studies at least uh, and I mean, it's fairly straightforward there because like the the content itself is in many cases constructed to be kind of emotionally provocative uh, and to like scare people or outrage people or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm guessing anxiety might play a similar role there. I'm not sure. Uh, we haven't looked at it, but uh, in, in like the case of uh, uh, COVID-19 in particular, I'm, I would, that seems like a plausible element that would be uh, influential for sure. Um, yeah, another, yeah. Question, another question from political behavior. Uh, there's research showing that topics that are rife with misinformation, such as gun control and arguably now also COVID-19, make people more resistant to fact checks about those issues. In other words, people are being trained to be resistant to fact checks on certain topics more than other topics. Do you think that tagging misinformation on COVID could ultimately make people resistant to updating their beliefs? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the extent that people are resistant to fact check, I think that, I mean, so most of the fact checking literature shows that it basically works, you know, like even, so the backfire effect that was the, that Facebook discusses as a, as a reason not to put fact checking, uh, to warn people, uh, things that have been fact checked be false. It doesn't happen. Like it seems to be pretty difficult to, uh, to like get in the lab even. Um, most of the time, if you give someone a fact check, they, basically kind of take it into you know consideration um and so overall i think it, probably it's fine there are 
it's like I said before, like there are trolls on the internet. Some people who, if you give them a fact check, they're going to, you know, uh, they'll react negatively to it. But, um, you know, we, we have to kind of uh, work towards what works best in the aggregate. And so overall, I think it probably works fine. Great. Do you want to ask a question or? Yeah, no? Uh, yeah, Hi. yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I want to go back to the, the, the previous question about the, the, the potential effects of anxiety. Um, because, you know, we know that anxiety leads people, you know, to, to, to pay attention, seek out more information. Mm -hmm. Is anxiety or maybe something else uh, also affecting cognitive, people's scores on cognitive reflection tests? Uh, yeah, I would, you know, the funny thing is I would always assume it's the other way around, you know what I mean? Like, uh, although it could be, I guess it could go both ways, um, that people are more reflective or better able to deal with anxiety. Um, we have some, I have this old study, uh, from 2013, it's not anxiety, but, uh, sleep paralysis. Um, one of my colleagues, emeritus professor when I was in grad school was a world expert on sleep paralysis. I'm not sure if you know what sleep paralysis is, but you, it's when you're, when your mind wakes up you're in a kind of semi-conscious state but your body's still you know like when you're dreaming about running you don't run across the room right uh, so your body kind of shuts itself down um so sleep paralysis is when you're kind of laying in bed and you can't move but you're semi-conscious and so people often like hallucinate they think there's a demon sitting on their chest or something um it's a very scary experience um and so we we devised this kind of post-episode distress uh measure that is how much do you spend like uh, ruminating about the next day or like how big of a problem do you think it is all that kind of stuff what we find is that people who are more reflective are lower on the on post episode distress they aren't that is the they have the exact same amount of kind of fear in terms of the episode itself but they just don't you know uh they just deal with it better they they uh, they i mean they they believe less supernatural things about it like less less kind of misperceptions about it they don't think that it's a demon on their chest um but over and above that they just were better able to deal with it and so that's what that's part of the reason why i think that it could, but it could, of course, go both ways. Like if you're in a, if you're in uh, an anxious state, if you're, if like something's agitated you, it's definitely gonna be harder to stop and think about things. Like so, you know, these things um, kind of work together in many ways. I have an unrelated question about uh, sophistication because I really like the idea of lumping these different measures of numeracy and reflection together. Um, but I'm also wondering um, how the results would look if you would decompose them because is it is it uh, you know being good at numeracy, numeracy probably correlates positively with being reflective mm -hmm. but it's probably not one and one the same yeah. so so can you say something about the it's obviously not saying something about the mechanism but it would tell us a little bit more which parts of the sort of sophistication are driving the results that we see yeah. Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, I should have put it in the slide, but I thought it um, So basically, in all three countries, the pattern is very similar. Uh, the correlations with uh, cognitive reflection, numeracy, and bullshit receptivity are about the same in magnitude uh, when that is in, pertains to misperceptions. The correlations are about 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0.3-ish. Um, the correlation with basic science knowledge is higher. So uh, basic science knowledge is about 0.4 in all the countries with uh, misperceptions so that so uh it's, it's sometimes higher it must make sense i mean they're kind of like two measures of the same sort of thing like really misperceptions is a kind of science knowledge questionnaire and so there's more conceptual overlap there but um yeah so yeah but there, there doesn't there's no consistent patterns where numeracy is stronger than reflection or bullshit they're all basically mm -hmm. and they're and they're all correlated in the extent to which most things in social psychology correlated like 0.23. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so this is a bit of a broader question uh, related to 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 sophistication, and because on the one hand, you see a lot of studies that that you know it's, it's need for cognition or it's cognitive reflection or it's you know in politics it's political knowledge. Um, we're often not testing at a different company, so we're we're investing in one measure or the other. Um, is there just some sort of overall sophistication latent traits that we should be focusing on rather than investing in our own sort of pet value sophistication measure? 
Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, so the, the, our measure definitely is not one measure, like so that we don't, like they're, they're, they're all correlated, but it would not make a very, it doesn't, it's not psychometrically a sound measure of sophistication. Like we, we're basically doing that for simplicity. Um, and so they're definitely different things. Um, for, in many cases, so basically it comes down to theory, right? Like if, if you have a specific reason to think that this is an avenue where reflection is more important than numeracy, and I've done lots of studies on that, like for religious belief, for example, reflection is a much stronger predictor than numeracy is uh, because it's whatever, it's more about changing your beliefs than it is about understanding things. Um, yeah. then, then it makes sense to make distinctions. In many cases, people make, uh, they just choose a measure that they like and then act as though the other ones don't exist, <laughs> or they, uh, and they think that that makes the distinction for them or whatever. Um, and so that doesn't, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, um, so yeah, that's my, that's my kind of view. I mean, like in, in the case of this perception of the book of 19, I didn't have any, like, I don't have any particular reason to think what numeracy would be a stronger or weaker predictor than uh, reflection. Mm -hmm. We just put them together. Like it's a general kind of factor. Um, and many things are like that, where it's just, Quality, like thinking, uh, having having uh, quality and um, quality reasoning, I guess is a good way to put it, uh, helps you in lots of domains. Um, so, yeah, that, that's my basic take on that. If I may, um, uh, there's there's not another question in the Q and A, so I'll, I'll ask you another question. Um, um, you you at, in some of the responses and also in your uh, in your own. It's not a lot of evidence of partisan motivated reasoning. Um, uh, maybe a little bit in evaluation in the in the first study, right? Um, but could you say a little bit more how you look at 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 that particular phenomena, which which in uh, in political psychology a lot of people think is probably one of the stronger. Uh, um, uh, predictions, but often the evidence is actually not so consistent, especially if we go into the mechanism. So say a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. I, I kind of cut that bit out because it, I can't talk about it without going long in the presentation. Um, so that, I mean, so uh, it's sort of part of it kind of depends on what you mean by motivated reasoning. And so part mm -hmm. of the reason why people view it as such a strong kind of predictor is that they just think that any partisan differences are attributable to motivated reasoning per se. Like, so if I, if liberals and conservatives disagree, like, you know, uh, that's motivated reasoning. Um, when I say motivated reasoning, I kind of mean like there's actual reasoning happening where, where the part of the mechanism is that people are actually kind of deliberating in a way that makes them move further apart based on partisan motivation. Uh, and so one way to assess that is looking at, uh, this is classic work by Dan Kahan, who uh, finds, for example, that like cognitive sophistication actually interacts with people's beliefs about global warming. That Democrats who are smarter are more likely to think it's a problem. Republicans who are smarter are actually less likely to think it's a problem. And so that seems to imply that part of the reason why that's happening is because they actually are better at kind of convincing themselves that what they want to believe is, is true. Uh, we don't find that for hardly anything. Like in, uh, we did another study on science beliefs. Like um, there's, there's hardly anything that you find that effect for. Basically, global warming, sometimes we see it for evolution, um, uh, and it just doesn't, it's not very robust. So it seems like that probably isn't happening. That, like, if it was the case that people were going to do that thing, it doesn't make that much sense. That would only be in this one context, right? Probably there's something else going on in the global warming context, and it relates to the kind of polluted information environment. You know what I mean? Like, it's a complicated issue, uh, global warming, and so, like, people who are smarter are, like, it, it, basically what it means is like even the smartest people can't wade through all the garbage when it comes to global warming. Like there's millions of dollars spent every year obfuscating about the issue. And so it, it's not, perhaps not surprising that non-scientists who are nonetheless smart can't figure it out. That's probably what's going on for global warming. That's in my view at least. Um, the other issue that pertains to more major reasoning is a lot, a lot of it could be driven by like prior beliefs, right? So like if partisans differ on how they interpret something, even how much they trust if you say it's a, it's a, this is a Democrat, this is a Republican, like it makes sense for a Democrat to trust a Democrat more than a, and a Republican trust a Republican more, right? Like we trust people that we're familiar with, you know, um, whether it makes sense in that particular case is a separate issue, but like overall, the, the kind of heuristic isn't, isn't completely illogical. Um, and so a lot of that can be explained looking at prior beliefs. And so we have worked with uh, Ben Tappan um, 
that you should check out uh, if you're interested in the prior belief angle. But yeah, basically, the motivated reasoning thing, it seems like there's a lot of, uh, it's an easy plug-in, uh, makes it seem like you have an explanation, but it doesn't really explain that much. Uh, and I don't think it, you know, in many cases, it doesn't, it's not operating at all. Yeah, no, that's, that, that, that um, resonates with some of my own uh, failed findings of the mechanism here. Um, uh, yeah, that, 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 that is, um, that, that's, that's great. Um, Christian, do you, Christian Feist, do you have any other questions? That I, I wanted to ask whether you, uh, especially in the United States, whether you looked at the geographical spread of these these respondents and since there's there's a lot of different policies per state and some are more in line with the central government and others are not. Is there any variation you find there? Uh, we have this. We have the state level stuff. I don't know that we have a large enough sample for it though. We, I didn't look at it partly for that. Like we have about 700 people. So we could, um, I should, I guess I should probably do that. Yeah. I mean, what I was thinking about doing was as we do different waves, kind of go back with a larger pool and, and look at that part a little bit more systematically, but I could, I mean, I'm mostly just being lazy and uh, shouldn't look at it yet, but um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense though. I mean, yeah, there's. Uh, yeah, especially the, uh, the the people who live in, in, in states that have Republican governors that aren't listening to Donald Trump. I think, yeah. I mean, that's sort of a mixed messaging. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It was, and I think that would be uh, pretty interesting for the later, uh, as we look across different waves over time, because the differences are getting larger. Like hmm. at uh, March 24th, most of the states were sort of on the same footing. Uh, um, there, you know, some some were early kind of adopters, but like things were just kind of getting started at the time. Um, but yeah, for sure. Like I, what I my naive expectation was that March twenty fourth was going to be the kind of apex of politicization. That like once more and more people uh, start getting uh, infected and like people actually start dying, that the partisan differences will decrease. <laughs> And I don't think that is like based on at least you know media reports and so on. I don't think that that's what's happening. I guess I'll look at the data to see if it's the case, but it might be that they're actually increasing, which would be a, a you know a real tragedy. I had one more question. Uh, maybe uh, maybe you've already covered it a little bit, but uh, I think these these sort of accuracy treatment. I think that that's very interesting. Can you speculate a bit on what the long-term effect of this would be? Uh, I mean, would it maybe wear off? I think it would wear off. Yeah. I mean, I think because basically the, I mean, the kind of mechanism is pretty straightforward. It's just that like, what, like if when people are engaging on social media, there's just a lot of different things that they think about when they're like deciding what to do, right? Like, are people going to like this? How does this make me look? You know, is it is it consistent with my ideology? Um, and so the treatment is just change those kind of cognitions a bit, you know, like, is it get, just put, is this true a bit higher on the thing? I mean, what you find actually is like, if you ask people directly, what is, what are the most important things when it comes to sharing on social media? Accuracy is like top ranked. Like they just think that's the most important thing, but they're just like, it's not that it's not incentivized on social media at all. Uh, or like hardly at all, depending on your circle, I guess. Um, so like it, it's not something that is reinforced very commonly so we can you know do some things to reinforce it but uh you know if it's you know reminding people about accuracy is not going to last forever you know what i mean this is it's going to last as long as the reminder lasts um and it, i mean the good thing is that it's simple to do but you know uh it's just one one potential thing that can be leveraged to help but that's basically it with the risk of zooming too much in on the United States, which might be sort of a particular case in, in, in handling this crisis, I do was thinking, but I'm just thinking out loud a little bit here, but would the case of the face masks be a way of getting at whether or not it's it's truly partisan actual following or so do people actually know it's dangerous or do they do they actually are they reasoning away the dangers and therefore not wearing it? Because you do have these these sort of the, you know, it's a little, mostly Twitter information here, but you see that that there seems to be a partisan difference in adopting that policy, um, and you get clear lead cues from Mike Pence not wearing it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I was wondering is is that a case where you could maybe 
get a little closer to the distinction between uh, um, knowing and doing. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like an honest signal. <laughs> right. If they, if they, if they, if they <laughs> Like they like exposing themselves to a disease to like to make a point a partisan point. Uh, that's yeah. a good question. That would be good. I mean, I would like to know if if we could just figure out the proportion of people who don't engage in that behavior, who genuinely believe that they don't need to, and or do. Oh, that would be great. Uh, that would be so interesting. Um, yeah. If you figure out how to do that, you let me know, and we'll and we can we can do a project. Well, so <laughs> I was just so some politi some political scientists have been have been paying people for their accurate for their more accurate perceptions right. uh, in terms of you know, the, the sort of uh, how's the economy doing. So, right. would, in the sense of would, would they believe that offering incentives gets you closer to the true opinion? I'm I'm not sure if that is always yeah. correct, but. But part of the issue is that what they, because you, as the experimenter, you determine accuracy. So they'll just say what you, what they think you think is accurate uh, when you incentivize yeah. them. Uh, so they, and they know that they, what, yeah. So for sure, almost all of them know that what they, what they should believe. Uh, but whether they believe it is another question. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, Hesh, you want to close uh, round off? Yeah. Um, so this is the end. Uh, it's almost <laughs> five here, and uh, uh, I think for us it's uh, it's almost time to to grab a beer or a glass of wine. Whereas Gordon has to work for another whole day before. Yeah. <laughs> I can start drinking. I can, I, you know, whatever. It's it's, it's a lockdown. It's a pandemic. It's it's <laughs> yeah. Who cares? <laughs> uh, Thanks a lot, Gordon. Uh, super interesting talk. And um, let me uh, just take another minute to announce uh, our next meetings. Next Friday is a public holiday here in the Netherlands. I have no idea what we are celebrating, but we have no meeting. Uh, the week after, so that's the uh, 29th of May, we have two talks by um, Christian Pipal, who's uh, the, the silent man usually here uh, in my screen on the left, hosting our sessions. He will talk about his PhD project, uh, trying to measure emotions in text. And uh, the second talk will be by Micah Homan, also a PhD student at the Hot Politics Lab, who uh, is studying uh, facial mimicry, whether uh, people mimic the expressions of politicians. And there will be some fresh results there, and uh, I'm also uh, hopefully uh, by that time we're also back in the lab actually collecting data because the lab has opened again uh, or at least it will on Monday. Um, the week after that we have the Faculty of Social Science Dean Agneta Fischer, a well uh, I must say a world-renowned psychologist in the emotion of uh, in, in psychology in the psychology of emotions uh, to talk about the relationship between emotions and populism. And uh, after that, we're still trying to get Stephen Reicher, who um, canceled at the council last week. As we were still trying to get him uh, to present. I'm not entirely sure if that will work out. Uh, but otherwise, we will also fill out our June schedule uh, with interesting talks. And um, so um, stay tuned. Uh, every Friday, we're here, except for next week. Uh, we're not. And uh, I just um, want to wish everyone uh, a nice weekend and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you.